For people around northern Michigan, Traverse City specifically, you've probably heard Tim's name, father, veteran, uh, Veterans for Peace, local chapter president, storyteller, and no doubt you've heard that he's a Vietnam War veteran, front lines as a teenager, and um, you know, that was kind of the story at the time. So many soldiers at that time were drafted right out of high school as you were. And you have an opportunity that not too many Vietnam veterans have or, or that they take advantage of, and that is that you are returning to Vietnam tomorrow. What does this feel like today? Oh, just, oh, Colleen, I can't, I can't even tell you. Um, I, I think the main thing for me that is really keeping me going on this is that uh, I hope, you know, with the post-traumatic stress stuff, um, we can help others that, that are trying to heal. And uh, so when I go there, I'm going to try to make some peace with former soldiers that are around my age who were my enemy Jake, he can talk to us a little bit. He's going to be, he's a skateboarder, yeah. a very accomplished skateboarder. So he's going to friend Vietnamese children and, um, and give them gifts. Yeah. And that, that'll be a big part of it, too, for me to watch him uh, interacting with people that were my age, that were my enemy then, but now he's giving them wow. gifts. November 17th, 1967 was the worst day of my life. Um, that was when we t took Hill 1338. We're going to go back to that hill the day after I met the, meet the NVA. And I want to light a candle on top of that hill with, with my friends here yeah. and just have peace. How does that make you feel as a, as a, as a veteran, as someone who has uh, suffered personally from this, um, th especially the moral injury of this special type of PTSD that people are now starting to understand it? If, you, if anyone that's experienced uh, combat um, and, and for me, it was continuous from November through February in 67, 68, to include the Tet Offensive. It's, just, it's that something that goes away, and it just stays with me forever. I was never free. Right. And maybe I'll get a little bit more freedom. Jake, you are Tim's son. What does it mean to you to be able to travel with him on this journey? We've been talking about it for almost nine months and to see it all come together and for me to be there to support my dad is like huge. We got on a regular commercial flight to Vietnam. I was 20 years old, scared shitless, had no idea what was coming, and uh, I remember landing in Vietnam. We, I think we were going to land in Da Nang, and the pilot circled a few times and said, "said something." The rumor had it the airstrip was being mortared. We had to land somewhere else. I so we, I think we landed in Saigon or something. I don't quite remember. But as soon as we got out, and there was other 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 soldiers getting on that were done, and they were, it was almost like the scene out of Platoon. They were. Just yelling, hey, how many, how many days you got? How many days you got to go? You know, you got, you got a year to go, man. And, and they're just harassing us and feeling re very, 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 very lonely. And even though I was with a bunch of guys. I don't have 365 days to go. <laughs> no. Thank you. Oh, man. Go to the hotel, drop your stuff off. I would suggest not crashing right away. Yeah, yeah. I ended up getting my orders, and, and they they said, uh, "You're okay, Keenan. You're going to go to um, um, A Company, Third Battalion, Twelfth Infantry." I go, okay, what is that? Oh, that's Light Weapons Infantry. And then they were going to send a helicopter out. Myself and two other guys are going to come. A helicopter. You go down there. There's a helicopter. And and I went down there, and they get on, and lifted off and we were I'm just sitting on the edge looking down and all I can see is jungle and I see no houses see no roads see no nothing I'm I am just I am just I'm scared 
then, but not nearly as scared as I was going to become. I thought he was going to go with one of his friends because I know they went through some of the same stuff. But I asked him and he said none of his friends want to go. I don't want to fucking go back there. And I understand that completely. So I just mentioned, I'll go back with you. If you want to go, let's go. And now we're here. And it's insane. I feel like I need to go back to Vietnam. I've kind of felt it a little bit for years, for years, but um, but not so much. I think as soon as my son was on board, I, he pushed me over and said, okay, I said, I'll go. I don't have that total um, disgust with that, with the Vietnamese people anymore. And I want to put that totally to rest. But the NVA is probably the biggest the biggest fear I have. About two years ago, I didn't talk to my dad a lot. After that, me moving to Brooklyn and starting to do things on my own, it made me realize that I don't, I don't have time in my life to be holding these shitty grudges with my dad. Because the times that I didn't spend connecting with him didn't feel right. And I regret that. He, like, he never likes to leave a confrontation with, like an, say an argument or say just something that he's had a problem with. I don't th he never he never leaves it on a bad note. So like, there's there's things that he's been working on for a long time, and that's that's what we're doing. We're here to to make peace with that, and for me to be there for him. Uh, we're meeting North Vietnamese soldiers tomorrow. This is a complete life changer. We did the same thing every day. Two guys dig the hole and fill the sandbags. One guy cuts a field of fire so, he, so no one can sneak up on it, and the other guy puts up trip flares and the claymore mines, and then and, and cuts down over, overhead cover. You cut down trees about this big to place on top of your bunker and then put the sandbags on top so you, so you can see out. You know. Every day we did this, and this one particular day, this is in September, later September, we came to this area and we came across a couple grass hooches, and the only people that were supposed to be around was enemy. We set up a perimeter around these hooches. It was still not reality to me, almost. And then our platoon leaders send sweep out. So there's four platoons, so you send sweep out in different directions. You just, three guys go out about maybe 75 meters or 50 meters, or whatever, go out and walk around, look, and then come back. And the other guys are doing the same, so you're sweeping the whole area. Uh, I think his name was Rodriguez or whatever. He said, Psst. and I looked over at him. He said, I, I just saw three guys walking back towards the perimeter. I said, well, that's probably the other sweep. They, they would be coming from that way. I looked over, I heard some noise. I looked over and there's these three, evidently NVA. They were kind of giggling, and this other one, he was like going like this, and he went and looked at me, and we made eye contact. And he was 
heavily armed AK-47, and all of a sudden, this is total reality. This is like, I, I can shake right now thinking about it, but I um, just flipped my weapon on automatic and I fired. Okay, okay, um, I am Tim Keenan and I fought in your country in uh, 1967 and 68. I um, was drafted in 1967, so I got a letter in the mail saying I had to, had to go in the Army, and if I didn't go in the Army, I would have to go to prison. I am honored, I'm honored to meet you. I had no idea how I would feel today, and, and um, I'll probably, probably get very emotional, and uh, you were my enemy, and I didn't want you to be my, my enemy, and um, I, I, I want to, um, I want to make peace. Ông nói là ông rất là vinh hạnh là được ngồi đây để mà nói chuyện với mấy anh. Là trong cuộc chiến ông là ông với mấy anh là kẻ địch. Nhưng mà bây giờ ông không muốn gặp. This is my son, Jacob. Đây là con trai của ông. I was around his age when I was here, or or yes. How old is he now? He's well. He's 25. So I was 20. He was. He he's now 10. He's 25. I was 20. I was 20. Ông này khi mà ông 20 tuổi á, ông qua Việt Nam. Cậu con trai ông bây giờ là 25 tuổi. Um. I don't know what else to say. I mean, can I can I hear something about? Right. One one by one. Yes. Yeah, and then and 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 I wanna I I wanna know you know name names and then then. Tôi là Lê Hữu Lộc. His name Mr. Lê Hữu Lộc. Hôm nay được mời đến để gặp mặt. He says that now he come here. First of all, he hope that both sides we forgot the hard day in the past, and now we are friends. We have very good friendship. He says that he doesn't want to talk about the war time because he had to fight against the enemy who came to do trouble things in his country. No more talking about fighting because he hoped that we are brothers. How long did it take them to accept the Americans that we aren't the enemy anymore? Mr. Duck says that we cannot tell you how long did we take to forget the war time and to accept you are no more enemy. But right now we know that we are no more enemies and mm -hmm. we are so appreciated. Thank you. Come on. I'm also... Um, President of Veterans for Peace in Northern Michigan. President of Veterans for Peace. For peace. In Northern Michigan. Yeah. Ông này là chơi bóng bóng chuyền. Bóng đá chứ. Bóng đá. Ông này ông này ông này là chơi bóng chuyền. Ông này cũng cầu chuột bóng chuyền cũng là người bắt bóng. Ông cũng là người bắt bóng cũng người là tung bóng tung bóng bắt bóng ông hết. Sau đó ông này là chủ tịch của cái hội cựu chiến binh. And we know each other more. And now we go to the second part of the meeting. Almost okay. Right. He says before he tell you more details about the doctor battlefield. He say yeah, these gentlemen they were there, but they say they were not the soldiers who hold the guns shooting to you at doctor, but they was. The leaders who told the soldiers how to fight against you in Dato, he have to inform you very important thing that the man who was the leader of that battlefield directly telling the people who who fight against you. So his name is Nguyễn Chơn, and Nguyễn Chơn was the the general. This gentleman, he was the general. He was, yeah. a, he was a general. He was a four-star general. This guy, four-star general. And the second division, 
who was at Dacto in 1967 till 69. And then there was the 173rd Division, and then there was the, I don't know who was all there, but I, I know I was in the 4th Division. I mean, what they're telling me is just fascinating. I mean, because uh, I didn't know where I was, and they were um, fighting for, a, a, I think, a, re a true reason. I, I didn't, all of us, all of us that were fighting, every one of us, yes. none of them, not one person wanted to be there. Yeah. And we were just trying to survive to get home. Does anyone, will anyone do one with me? No, I'm talking about an NBA. Only two of them will be on behalf. Okay, good. Yes. That's yeah, all we need. <laughs> oh, yes. Right here, another one. Oh, my God. He says, just this one, not with this, because okay. with this one, it will be stronger. Well, well yeah. Tall guys in the front. Short guys in front. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The time they got here, you know, and they were, they were like kind of guarded a little bit, you know. I, I know they oh, yeah. uh, they weren't even around. No, I wasn't around Doctor O. Then, and then part two, he said, "Now I'll tell you the rest of the story." We were yeah. around Doctor yeah. and then they were all about love. They were just all about peace and understanding and uh, respect. They're real people. They were. I, I always had the utmost yeah. respect for them. Yeah, but you never knew them. No. That, that was kind of interesting to get a chance to know them. Who are you? I want to know who my enemy was. And now I want to know who my friend. Their children have peace. And their grandchildren, they, they have peace. They haven't been at war for a while. Yeah, for, for, for and how, generations. And how long were they at war before? Oh, 300 years. Yeah. That's special. It is special. That's so special. It is special. November 16th, we were moving to this place. We were going to take this hill, 1338, because they're measured in meters, I suppose. It seemed like we got up there. It was very quiet for a long time, halfway uh, up the hill, maybe, maybe a little bit further, and then all this. Shit. 
all hell broke loose. Before we went up the hill, we airstruck the hill. I mean, 500 pound bombs, bombing, and then napalm and burning, you know, the jungle and uh, Agent Orange, I'm sure. The, the NVA, they didn't have any of that stuff. They didn't have artillery, they didn't have airstrikes. But they would fight us, you know. We were getting beaten back and so, they called in airstrikes again and we were all just lying there. You're trying to you're trying to be invisible. You're so scared, you know. And there's a couple guys over here behind that were just lying sitting by a tree and they were just they weren't wounded at all, but they were wounded, their heart was wounded, their brain was wounded, they were just they were like this, like like they were in an institution, you know, they're with what and then and not on their medication. They were just going like this, shaking like back and forth like this because they were, they had lost it mentally. It was daylight. I don't know how long it took to take that hill, but because we left early in the morning, it was it was mid to late afternoon. We dug in, dug our holes, and sat around. I don't think anyone was talk did much talking about the activities of the day. You don't. That's what you don't have time to grieve death. You don't have time to grieve death. You just you don't even talk about it. We talk about uh, sports. Everyone was the homecoming king. Everyone was this football star. You know, everyone had the most beautiful woman. And we're talking, we dug in. We ended up staying on Hill 1338 for like two days. And we moved on. And uh, I think we went and took Hill 1294. And uh, I remember being out on patrol and they're calling us in and saying that the NVA is back on Hill 1338. So we had to go back. So November was just like constantly taking hills, hills, and hills. I always remember the first 20 minutes are the hardest. What? Going up a mountain. Oh, yeah. Hiking. 20 minutes are hard, then you get into a groove. But, it's going to be good. It's going to be weird. Don't think about it. I still, I can't grasp it, what, where I am right now, or where I'm standing. My dad was on the ground, maybe where I'm sitting right now, with bullets shooting past his head. I mean, I appreciate it even more. Love you. I love you too, Jaker. So, I want to light a candle, Jake, you and I. And uh, let's not burn the jungle down. Although we could probably find our way to 1338 if we did. <laughs> and here we are, out in the jungle in Vietnam, and um, we're really not far. In fact, right down there is uh, November, like right around now of 47 years ago, where I just want to, you know, recognize my friends. Uh, that were with me. Mike Lawton and Jim Palmer, they were still with us and they're still alive and well. And Captain Foy and Sergeant Fisher, who got hurt here, Lieutenant Griffin, who died here, and uh, Jim Phillips and Tom Monahan and Schweitzer and Jim King and Tom Anderson and Kevin Corcoran and Ricky Cannon and all the medics that were so wonderful. Um, they would brave fire and, and do anything to save anyone. Lenny Raguzio and Jeff Baker and Cumby and Tex, who died later, and Lloyd Slack, my good friend from Grand Rapids, that uh, got killed near Christmas. Denny Leach, my mentor, lost his leg. Uh, Jim Nix, Yogi, Tipido, the Colonel, I'll never forget you. Do Joe Holman. Sergeant Andrade, who was, I was his uh, radio telephone operator when he died in February 27. Sergeant Brill, Sergeant Rigdon, Sergeant Forbes, who had the smallest feet of any man I've ever known, size three. 
Lieutenant Ernst, Glass O'Flaherty, who died a couple years of cancer related to Agent Orange. The family and friends. Of all those that were killed in action and or came home a different person. Especially the family and the friends. And to the many noble patriotic NVA who lost their lives on this hill and other hills fighting for their fighting for themselves and their, their own freedom. And to their family and friends. I'm glad to have met them. They show me much love. And they showed it back because I love them now. That's it. Now we're sitting out here in the fucking jungle. And I can't believe I'm here. hit him because he he sprawled uh, chest first and my adrenaline in my heart was going a mile a minute uh, I what just happened here but then I made my way over to the guy that I thought was was hit initially the guy that I made eye contact with and I was crawling over by him because I, he could have been still alive I don't know and uh, or He's not, maybe not, not even there. Maybe I'm gonna get killed or whatever. I'm, I'm scared shitless, basically. He's hit badly. He's, I didn't know at the time, but he was dead. But his, when you're, when that happens, you, your body jumps around. I mean, it's a horrible scene. You're taught in AIT, uh, in training or whatever, even, and guys are boasting about it. Whenever anything happens, you get, get souvenirs so we can bring them home. So I, I okay, I'm, I'm gonna get souvenirs off this dude. And I reach and I and I find uh, I find this guy's wallet. You know that's cool. And you know maybe he's got some money in here. I can you know it, it, North Vietnamese money, man. It's a great souvenir. And I I open up the wallet. I open it up and I see pictures of his family. There he is with his little sister standing proud soldier in pictures with his, look like his friends, just like I carried. And uh, a picture of like, look, look like him and his mom. Anyway, I didn't of course let on at the time, but uh, that changed my entire attitude uh, I couldn't believe it all happened and um, I put the, I put the stuff back I put his wallet back I didn't take anything off him and uh, and then for the next I probably did, I probably didn't sleep for three or four days after that <laughs> that was my introduction to that does Mr. Tewitt see those other people? I want to um, like give each of them a candle from me um, to as just an expression of uh, peace, of love and peace. And um, I want to give you this as uh, a, a gift from me to you. It says, "From soldier to soldier." This này là từ những người chiến sĩ tặng những người chiến sĩ. From soldier to soldier. Đã là chiến sĩ. A bracelet. Uh, you gotta figure out how it works, so. Oh, here it goes. Yeah. I should have. Oh, here we go. Good 
you understand? Mm -hmm. To put the candles on the altar. On the altar, yeah. To show up that he respect. To the gift you give to him that is love and peace. Did you um, lose many really close friends when you were in, in, in the war? Anh có mất nhiều các bạn chiến đấu, bạn và bạn thân thiết. Many, many. Một mình là châu tám đứa luôn. Just himself, he have to bury eight other close friends. He did. How often did you ever get a chance um, to go, to um, to to go home to your to your mom or your family uh, when you were in the war? He had no chance to do that. His hometown is in Quảng Ngãi province. Have you ever heard about the Mỹ La massacre? Mm -hmm. It was his hometown. His hometown was Milai. What did he, what what did you think of us? Sau cái trận mà thảm sát ở Mỹ Lai á, thì anh đã nghĩ như thế nào về nước Mỹ? Cái ngày thảm sát Mỹ Lai thì anh không có cái này, nhưng mà nói chung là anh về của ngái, anh xuống thăm và đồng thời anh có viết cái bài Mỹ Lai. So he said. When we had the Mỹ Lai massacre, he was not here. But after that, he came back and he wrote an article about Mỹ Lai massacre for everybody to know. Anyone from the United States, uh, America, did they ever apologize and say, I'm sorry for what we did? Có cái ông lính Mỹ nào đã cảm thấy ăn năn hối cải đã tạo ra cái cuộc thảm sát Mỹ Lai ông gặp trực tiếp anh chưa? Không Not yet, he didn't hear he didn't see any American telling him something about that I mean, can I um, I, I, I speak for many, many um, ex-soldiers in saying that um, I'm so sorry that war led to that. War leads to what we did, and uh, I'm just I'm just so sorry. I'm I'm speaking for all of the American people. I, I do believe, and just saying, I'm so sorry. That should never have happened, and um, I hope. Uh, I know it's going to. Yeah, I know it'd be very hard for you to ever forgive something like, like that. He says that, of course, during the war time, both sides enemy had to kill each other. He said, why? They hurt him like that, and he feel so sad, so angry, but he's happy to forgive because he knows that not only him but some other people from the other side they had the same problem and he wants everybody will be good friends good brothers to have the good life in the future i love you i'm i'm i love you neil will you take a picture yeah i would love to Here, take a picture of all of us. Okay. Come, 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 come. <laughs>